Greetings, everybody. Welcome to the broadcast. I am your host, Maggie Cavanaugh, Keys to Your Best Life. And I have a dear friend, mentor, sister in Christ with me today. I'm so honored to have Monica Smeltzer. Monica, welcome to the broadcast. Thank you, Maggie. I'm really glad to have the opportunity to talk to you and talk with everyone today. I love it. I love it. You know, we're all snowed in. Uh, we're here in the Middle Tennessee area and wherever you're at, we're praying for you as well as far as the storms. Please stay safe, but grab you a cup of joe or a cup of juice or water or whatever your beverage of choice is and sit down because Monica and I are going to talk about a topic today that it pertains to everybody. There is not a single person that doesn't have some type of relationship. <laughs> some That's of right. us have multiple, right? We're mothers, we're daughters, we're sisters, we're aunts, we're wives, we're, you know, mothers. I mean, the list goes on and on. So, Monica, I know you recently uh, just came out with a book with a couple of amazing women. Can you tell them a little bit about the new book? Yeah, so the new book is Messy to Meaningful, and the first Messy to Meaningful was Lessons from the Junk Drawer, right? So we took <laughs> objects from the drunk, junk drawer and taught lessons in, that applied to real life. So this one is my purse overfloweth, right? <laughs> so it's, see, we laugh because we all understand that, but we've got a lot of relationship stuff in that book. And I think you're right, Maggie, we all have served so many different roles in our life and have so many different relationships. So I think what we talk about today will touch and will impact everybody. I believe that. I believe that. And I just want to put a shout out to that book, because if you have not read the first one, y'all need to go read it because uh, all of us have junk drawers. And I kind of chuckle about the purse because I got to the point where I was hardly carrying a purse because my purse would run it over. So uh, <laughs> I'm honored to be a part of the launch team of that. And when they asked what's in your purse right now, I thought nothing because I'm carrying my cell phone and my card because I don't even want to go near my purse is so overwhelming. So that's how we get sometimes with our different relationships is it can be a bit overwhelming. Now I know uh, in the first book, so many of the things I could relate to, but in the second book, when it comes to relationships, you wrote some chapters in there that are very much applicable to what we go through uh, and how we need community. What would you say about the whole community piece? So I wrote in the book about community and, and I, I said this, and this is why I think it's so great that I can talk with you today, Maggie. I consider myself kind of relationship challenged, like relationships don't come easy for me, right? Even living in community with other believers, right? As much as we need that, and as much as the cross is our safe place, it can be hard to get to know other people. It can be hard to trust other people, um, all of those things. And so while I talk about community and living in community as essential for our faith and growing in relationships, it can be tough and hard. And what I try to do, Maggie, is use myself as an example and things that I've learned over the years um, that will really help us have, you know, better relationships. Wow, that's so incredibly important because anything worth having requires our effort. And to have good relationships, we really have to cultivate them. It's not like they just fall into your lap. You know, I'm thinking specifically about many years when I was a very broken woman and I just, I couldn't, I didn't trust anybody. And I was like a porcupine. If you got too close to me, I was going to prick you. And I had no relationships and especially no relationships with women. Uh, and I don't know why, you know, I just was in, I guess it was, you know, whatever the case may be, I did not trust. But when I moved to Middle Tennessee in 2005, I met a group of women that were very transparent. They were very open and they were very, um, very much allowed me to be me with no restrictions. And we started to cultivate friendships. And I have to say now, I relationships are my my gig, my, it's my jam, it's my stuff that I love because I love to connect people, but I also understand that there's obstacles for a lot of people. And when we get to that place where we overcome it to a certain extent, we, you know, we, we're constantly overcoming mm -hmm. and constantly changing, but it is very fruitful to have people in your circle for accountability and uh, for uh, nourishment, you know, spiritual nourishment, uh, that iron sharpening iron and so forth. But you're right, getting to the core of getting to know people can be, it's awkward almost. 
you know, it can be so awkward. And I, I think, Maggie, like even today on, on your broadcast and social media, it allows communication, right, to go forth. People are sharing about themselves. And I, I talk about in the book that, you know, sometimes it's not wise to overshare, you know, like everything is not for everybody. Like, I feel so happy when I hear you talk about how now you're in a happy place with your relationship. You've got a group of women that you know and that you trust. And I think sometimes people look on social media and think, wow, well, you know, if everybody's not my best friend day one, if I, if I don't share everything, well, then I'm not being honest. And, you know, that's not, that's not true. One of the things I know for me, as I said, relationship challenge, and I'm an introvert. So I'm kind of a slow goer when it comes to relationships. And so I've learned that about myself. And it's like, it gives me that time to get to know someone. And trust is built slowly. And it's built over time. And one of the ways when you talk about like, you are a porcupine, and if people got too close, right, they would get hurt. We one of the ways that we can guard our hearts, which the Bible tells us to do, one of the ways that we can do that is to go slow and to give relationships time and to figure out other people's perspectives and to learn more about ourselves. Now, there's no foolproof way not to get hurt or not right. to get betrayed. But yet, if we are willing to go slow and take risks, over time, we can develop better and stronger relationships. Wow, that's so good. And I wish I would have known some of those keys, if you will, earlier in my life, because Me too. I have, yeah, I have been in positions where I've overshared, you know, and now I'm trying to I, I'm very transparent, you know, but not everybody needs to be that transparent. And there, it has to be in a safe environment. And so many times people will set, ask me, they'll say, can you talk about this story? And I'm like, well, you know, that was for that group at that time because of the Holy Spirit. And it's not something I want to share publicly, but I would share with maybe 50 or 100 women in a setting where it's safe for, for the for the purpose of allowing them to take their mask off or to, um, you know, stop and realize they're not alone. But mm -hmm. many times uh, the enemy will take our stories and try to twist them and pervert them and all kinds of stuff. So I've gotten to the point now where I finally think I'm learning. And I say learning because we don't ever arrive no, to watch my, yeah. Who is that audience? You know, because we are under a spotlight. Right. And, oh, go ahead. No, that's one of the things I even tell people that want to be on the Bridges show and something that I guard my own family with. If if there's a story in my life and it it touches one of my family members, even if I want to share it, if my family member does not want that exposed, I zip it. I don't talk about it. And there are people that have approached me about being on Bridges and say, well, you know, I want to talk about, uh, for example, one woman wanted to talk about how God forgave her after adultery and restored her life. And I applaud all of that. But then she shared with me that her mom and her ex-mother-in-law didn't know these details. And I said, you know, oh. you do not want to go on television and, sh and have family hear that story for the first time. That is a way to destroy relationships, right? That's not a way to build them. That's exactly right. And we do have to protect our relationships. Um, you know, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that recently I was on a, a podcast and we were just talking freely and openly, just like you and I, you know, in conversation. And it came up something that I had experienced in my marriage many years ago. And not that it, this person it's not that, you know, my son is not aware of what happened. He's totally aware of it. But the Lord had me reach out to them and ask them to edit that out. Because I had prayed about it and it's like, OK, yes, this is my story. This is my reality. And this is an important thing for me to learn right now because I'm actually working on my story and it affects a lot of people. But my story is my story. And just because there are people in my story doesn't necessarily mean that they are ready for that to be out there in front of God and everybody. And God knows. OK, he was there. <laughs> but but it's 
their portion of the story. And it's and it's a delicate balance. And I think, you know, the Bible tells us that, you know, we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And our testimony is so important. But we can tell our testimony to give God glory, not so much of what we did, but how he got us through it. And not necessarily bring in all of the pieces or the people that were part of that. Unless we have permission. I always would tell my kids, that's not your story to to, to share. Exactly. And I think that that's really both a safe and a sacred guideline, especially for anybody that's a believer in Christ to respect where we all are on yes. our journey of faith. And we can not sharing every single detail. You know, I've heard people say, well, but that's just honest. And it's like, no, honest is not saying everything we've ever done, every place we've ever been and telling other people stuff. It's sharing what we can, what's safe, what's best, and what we have permission to share. And I think one of the ways to really build trust, which is the foundation of any relationship, yes. a friendship, a marriage, a church relationship is trust. And when we share too freely or too loosely and without other people's permission, man, that's a way to step all over people. And it's not a relationship builder at all. Absolutely. And, you know, we have to be careful even for those that aren't in close relationship is something that is a valuable lesson that I've been working on trying to really understand is not triggering people. Yeah. Yeah. Because they might not be in our close relationship, but if they feel threatened um, by something that we're communicating, they will never, you know, like maybe it's someone you're ministering to. Uh, you know, and you're, you know, you're trying to help them through a difficult time and they're maybe in crisis and they don't know Jesus. What we say and do, even in a surface relationship with someone that we don't know, can cause as much damage as it can help. Yeah. Yeah. And God loves everybody. Yes. Even those, even those that don't know Christ yet. And Amen. So I think when we set that example uh, and that, that showing people that we are trustworthy, that we're caring. And his word says, you know, the world will know that we're his disciples by what? By our love for one another. And love includes being intentional. It includes being safe. And so I like to say to myself and to others, OK, let's make sure that this is safe and that it honors everything that's sacred. Let's build this relationship and so much better to go slowly and build it right than to damage it and have to do damage control afterward. Wow. Wow. That is so important. Yeah, because undoing those things can take time and it's a painful. It's kind of like uh, pulling a Band-Aid off. You know, you can slap it on there pretty quick to stop the bleeding. But when you go to rip that thing off, is there's going to be some, you know, hair pulled out and everything else and, and pain that comes along with that. Mm -hmm. Relationships are so incredibly important and community is important as well. I always, you know, I was recently talking to some middle schoolers at my church and I was talking to them about difficult relationships because they are out there in the world and they're dealing with, you know, the changing culture, rapidly changing culture, let me add. But they're having to deal with a lot of people types and a lot of lifestyle things and a lot of things that, you know, are not glorifying God. And my encouragement to them was it does not matter uh, where someone is at. We still need to respect we still need to honor. We don't have to agree, you know, with their sin. And just because they choose to sin differently than what we choose to sin does not mean that they're not valued. And we need to make sure. And I think a lot of times as believers, that's why so many people, well, my personal experience, it took me a long time to come into the kingdom because I had this misconception that all Christians were against me that they thought they were better than me and all of that. And then whenever it was really a lie from the enemy, but we put expectations on people to be God and they're not, but we still need to walk in a godly way yes, and to do. give him glory and to protect those relationships. So that's pretty powerful. I love in the book and, and I, I, I've got to get, I've got to get in it and get some more revelation, but I love the fact that you talk about community because we have a lot of different types of community. You know, we have our coworkers, we have our church family, we have extended, you know, whether you're involved in, in uh, community activities or you serve on committees and things like that. Monica, talk about the importance of community. Well, I think that, you know, we learn so much from the people that are around us. And so, you know, you had mentioned like accountability, which that's 
extremely important, but also we need people to bounce ideas off of, right? Yeah. We need people that we can laugh with. You know, for me as an introvert, my tendency is to want to do life on my own, but I don't really grow my best way and I don't really live the best that I can when I'm all by myself. I need other people's uh, valuable input to help grow my faith, even in a coworker situation. I mean, we need to be able to depend on those around us and we also need to be dependable. We need to be, contribute you know, to whatever team that we're working on. And I think when we understand as a believer in Christ that our safe place is the cross, mm -hmm. we understand that our identity is completely in him, yes. then we're able to enjoy community in a new way. Because we're not depending on community for, I, for our identity. We're not depending on community to affirm us. Yeah. Right? Then we're able just to really help people to give and receive. We're able to laugh. We're able to forgive more easily because we're not depending on people for everything. We've made the cross our safe place. We've made Christ our identity. And when we, when we do that, like even when others let us down, when he's really first and foremost, well, sure, we're still going to be disappointed. We might still get hurt, but it's not going to be earth shattering because we've got a foundation. And so I think that's the piece of community that we can be missing, because I think today, especially in social media and the way life is played out, everybody's into everybody's business and <laughs> liking this or hating that or cancel culture or this or that. And we can't make all this our everything. Oh. He has to be our everything. And when he is, we're better able to keep co-workers, family members, HOA committee members. We're <laughs> able to keep those relationships stronger because we don't need them in a needy sort of way. Does that make sense? Oh my gosh, that makes total sense. And that's where the focus needs to be. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes that we do, we take our eyes off the cross and we look at the circumstances and we get caught up. And, you know, this last year was a perfect example of just so much, you know, headbutting and opinions. And, you know, I'm just like, I don't even wanna, I, the only thing I wanna focus on is what is he saying to do right now? Because it was so overwhelming. You know, I'm on social media a lot and I see a lot of things and people are like, you know, they're on and they're off and they're, you know, there's a whole addiction to that. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. But the reality is, is that if we look through the lens of Christ, if we stop and, and I know it's a cliche of what would Jesus do, but I think we need to have those bracelets back. I think we need to have the bracelets back. back. Yeah, they have them at publishers because I just, you know, had a conference and I bought some stuff for gift bags and I seen them. So y'all get your Jesus. What would Jesus do? And if we ask ourselves that every day, Lord, what would you have me to do? Lord, what would you have me to say? And for people, you know, your personality type is introverted. So you probably are a little bit more skilled at pulling back and, and, and processing for people like me that are like real extroverted. It's real hard. I'm like, our mouths get way out in front of us sometimes. And it's like, oh gosh, I just want to pull it all back in because it. we have to be, in, like you said, intentional. I have to be intentional to spend time with the father to know what to say, to keep me from me and my big mouth getting a whole lot of trouble. And it's just, you know, and I think what you said is so important whenever it comes to those around us, because God, you know, we're all fearfully and wonderfully made. Yes. God loves us all so much, but he made us so different. I mean, you know, our fingerprints are even, you know, so intricate and special and our personalities and our temperaments. And a lot of times we communicate with people based on who we are rather than looking at who they are. And I had did this for years and, you know, and that's where we get into trouble with these unrealistic expectations because we want people to think like we think, act like we act, do like we do. And when they don't, we're like, what does it matter with you? What would you say to that, Monica? Well, I think that you said it, you know, exactly right, that we in our human nature, we want other people to be like us. And really you know, Maggie, that's dangerous and it's unrealistic. And thank God that other people aren't exactly like us and don't think like us. And so we need to step back and learn to appreciate how God has wired other people. 
Yeah. And it's also quite arrogant and prideful to think that everything that we do and say is right. And that if you don't think like me, well, then you must really not be saved. And I don't know how, you know, we get into all this stuff and it's so negative. I learn so much by having relationships with people mm -hmm. who are gifted in areas that I'm not gifted. Yes. Who have interests that I don't have. I learn so much from them and can be so challenged. And it's just a great place, honestly, when you can have a relationship that's good with somebody that's different, where you can laugh with each other about your differences. I have people that I can go to that I know are probably wired more logically than I am. So when I know that I need a little more logic, they're the people that I go to. And I'll be like, help me see this from a different perspective. And boy, that's a beautiful relationship. Oh my goodness. Yes, it is. You know, it's like I tell people in, in marriages that, listen, if y'all were alike, one of y'all wouldn't be needed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we balance each other. My, um, my husband and I are so different. We were chuckling. We were listening to a friend of ours talk about, uh, you know, different. there's so many different personality types and assessments out there, but they were talking about the gems. And I'm a little bit of a sapphire over here. And, you know, we were talking about me and my husband's like, wait a minute. You know, we thought you were a sapphire, but sometimes you're a ruby and a little bit of a pearl and all of this. And I thought, you know, I used to tell people I'm the baby of nine kids. And my mom used to say I'm a little bit like all of them. And I'm like, no wonder I'm so messed up. I got like, you know, eight different personalities, you know. And when I do these assessments, I kind of fall in that center. And I never will forget that. And I thought to myself, wait a minute. I have really got to take a look at me because I'm the only person I'm in charge of. And how do I interact with God's creation? Right. And whether I like it or not, uh, I still, they, people are fearfully and wonderfully made, whether they're serving the Lord or not. And if they don't see that through me, then I could discourage them and from being able to have a relation with the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. You know, I want, Maggie, when I'm talking with people, even when I'm reading a social media post that is really hateful, toward Christians. Sometimes I will just say to myself, okay, but God loves this person as much as he loves me. Now yeah. this person may not be at a good place right this moment. They may not be saved, but how I treat them says something to God about where I am on my journey. And, yeah. you know, the Bible says we're to love even those that are our enemies. And I can hear people say right now, yeah, but I don't have to like everything they do. Here's the thing. We don't. But when we get all like that, I don't have to like everything they do. It shows we have stuff in us that we don't need. Yeah, it really does. And so we really, before we start thinking about everybody else and what they're doing, yes. I think you said it right, Maggie, we need to think about ourselves and how we're honoring God. And if we're honoring God, and if we're not, what else we can do? And again, I'm not talking about approving of sin. Right, I'm right. Talking about living, uh, you know, just anything goes kind of a nature. I'm talking about loving people where they're at, respecting people, and knowing who I am in Christ, and that I know right from wrong. And if the doors open for me to share Christ with someone, I'm going to walk right through that. Yes. But in walking through that, we don't have to be mean and hateful and critical of people. Amen. That's never okay with the Lord for us mm. to be mean and critical, regardless of what they do. You know, Jesus hung on the cross, bruised and beaten for, you know, for us. Mm -hmm. And he still said, forgive them. They know what not what they do. So if Jesus could hang on the cross going through all of that and still ask for forgiveness, can we not scroll past the, the stuff? Can yeah. we not just take our little mouths and just go on and say, God bless them, give them revelation, Amen. Help them not be critical and judgmental. Amen. And, and instead of being critical and judgmental, I think you just said, you know, pray for them, right? Yes. God, let the scales fall from their eyes. Bless them, Father. You yes. love this person. Bless them. I, you know, not only would it be beneficial for them, it would make our lives better too. Because a lot of people that are so judgmental and so critical, I know they have to be miserable. Oh, like, yes. You can't, you can't be pointing fingers at people and saying all of that and not be miserable yourself. So then where is 
the joy of our salvation, <laughs> right? And what are we like then with our family and with other people if we're carrying around all that negativity? Um, God made us to be in community. We're to enjoy people. And yes. uh, we can pray for those in which we disagree. That's so true. That's so true. And we're not, listen, y'all, we're not talking about not having boundaries because boundaries right. are important. We could do a whole episode on boundaries. It's incredibly important to protect yourself from those. But we have to also understand that hurt people, they hurt people. That's and right. you know that's, that's why I was always, you know, spewing out before many years of counseling and deliverance and, you know, the word of God, you know, cleaning me up and so forth. And so we have to be sensitive. And I just, you know, I'm to the point now where I'm like, Everybody I look at, there's that saying that if not for the grace of God, there go I. Yeah. Because there's nothing that people can't do that maybe if, with our circumstances, we might not have been involved in as well. Yeah. And so and it brings me to the topic of in your book, you talk about, you know, some addiction stuff in that book. And it's so important because that's an area where people get really critical and judgmental. And, you know, I, I spend a lot of time in the, um, you know, addiction community because of my own story and because of those that I've served. But one of the things that was said one time to me really stuck with me. Someone said when your child overdoses or when someone is, you know, very emotionally ill with active addiction, you know, people will, you know, if they got cancer, they'll bake you a cake and come over and comfort you. Mm -hmm. But when they're in, if people are in active addiction, a lot of times it's just like, oh, you know, well, oh, it must have been their parenting or yeah. it must have been this or it must have been that. Let's talk a little bit about that role of people in active addiction and loving those and having those relationships and what can we do to help them? Yeah. You know, Maggie, I'm, I'm so glad that, that you've brought up the subject because I think that one of the things that, that I talk about in the book is that whether a person believes that addiction is a choice or that it's a disease is entirely up to them. That's like, right. I'm not, I'm not gonna even try to argue with that. It, it's right. a controversial subject, but the point is, do we love people? And I know that sometimes it, there can be that fine line between enabling and tough love. There's all of that. But yeah. one of the things that I say in the book is that even if you don't know anybody that's struggled with addiction, I think that we need to take heed and listen up because someday we may work maybe in a cubicle next to a woman who's cried every tear she can cry, who's prayed every prayer that she can imagine over her addicted prodigal. And she needs a no judgment zone. Yes. She needs somebody to pray for her and to help her. And one of the things that I talk about, you know, addiction is addiction involves the whole person and it affects everybody, family members, co-workers, all of that, right? It's, it's, it exists on a physical level, an emotional level, a spiritual level. So I highly recommend everybody get all of the Christian counseling, the medical treatments yes. they need. But one of the things I think that we should never underestimate is the power of grace. Grace is so powerful, right? Yes. Grace makes all of hell tremble. Grace <laughs> makes religious people mad. And <laughs> grace can free the addicted. And grace can free the enabler. And Come so on. <laughs> I, we, You know, just heavy duty doses of grace. Grace. <laughs> And more grace. And so, of course, you do all the things, the prayers, the counseling, the medical treatment, all of that. But let's soak in God's grace. Let's pray that for the addicted and for the enabler. Many times people don't know the hard road that someone that's in active addiction travels, travels and they don't know the hard road that family members, there's no room for pointing fingers and for being mean and saying, well, that was your parenting. Well, you chose that too bad. People are dying. Yes. Families are falling apart. I had a mom say to me once on Bridges, it just breaks my heart. Her child died of an overdose and she felt like no one would comfort her at the funeral. This is a few years ago because it was like your kid just made bad choices. I think we've come farther in the compassion category than a few years ago. But can you imagine to not only lose your child to a tragic death, but to have people think also that you are a bad mom? 
it's uh, very, very sad. Shouldn't be happening. No, it shouldn't. The shame that comes along with uh, active addiction, not just for those that are using, but those mm -hmm. that are family members is tremendous. And that's why, you know, it's important for us to be that safe place. That, And I love that non-judgmental zone. Matter of fact, I'd like to have that. I'd like to have a T-shirt that says I am a non-judgmental zone. You know, <laughs> people know that we are safe. Right. Yeah. You know, yes. I have people very close to me that struggle with yes. addiction and I, I uh, joined um, Celebrate Recovery. I memorized uh, the prayer so that I could say it because anybody that's been down this road, you know that when someone you love is on that road of active addiction, yes. you don't know what's coming next. That's right. You don't know. You do not know what is going to happen. It is completely outside of your control. And people may say, well, I would do this and I would do that. I will say this. You don't really know till you get there. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. You know, and and Monica, you know, you know a lot of my story, my personal story, and I've been on both sides. I've been on the codependent side and I've been on the active addiction side. And I can tell you um, if you're watching this and you think that I'm not the one using, so therefore I don't need help, please get help because okay. I was much crazier as a codependent than I ever was a drug addict. I'm just yeah. saying. Yeah. And the reality is, is that we all need help. And, and if we can just take that, that uh, I love what you said about, you know, uh, seeing them in a way without being critical or wondering why, you know, or that they chose that. Yeah. Okay. So maybe they did the first time they used make a bad choice. Have you made a bad choice yourself before? You know, and to really look at our lives and say, Maggie, <laughs> we've all made bad choices. That's right. And I was thinking about the other day, just God's grace. There, I was just like in high school and my friend and I were out driving around. And I, I don't know why we did this, but it was an area where all the kids kind of drove around. And these boys signaled for us to pull over. And we did. And they asked us to get in their car and ride around. Now, I want to say this. I was a Christian girl. I just thought these boys are cute. Now, we got in their car. We drove around. And thank you, Jesus. They were just nice boys. After we drove around a little bit, they took us back to their car. Praise God. Yes. That could have gone so much differently. Yes. That was such a stupid choice that I made as a teenager. I look back and I think, Monica, what were you thinking? Well, clearly, I wasn't thinking. Right, Maggie? And so I think we need to give people that kind of grace that maybe they did open a really bad door in their life. Maybe they made a horribly poor choice and, and continued to do so. But have we not been all been recipients of grace? Amen. Amen. And that's a wonderful way to look at it. And so encouraging because someone out there is dealing with this. And, you know, we we probably um, most of us know someone that is in this situation currently and they need our support. They need our comfort. They need the community. They need that safe place. And I love that you mentioned to celebrate recovery after for so many people there because that's for people that have hurts and habits and hang ups. So listen, we all have had one of those. I'm just saying, you know, how could we have Yeah, exactly. How could we possibly live in this fallen, broken world and not have a hurt? a habit or a hang up. Yes. Some of those habits might put us in prison. Others may not, but they're still habits. We all have something in our life that's bigger than us and that without Christ, we cannot overcome. And if we could just understand how hopeless we are without God and how much hope we have in him, I think that we would all be so much kinder to each other. Wow. And so we true. Could pray in love. Mm -hmm. That is so true. So, Monica, if I was to ask you, uh, if you could leave the viewers with a key, just one key of what you think would help people in relationships or your favorite scripture in regards to relationships, what would that key be? You know, I would say, Maggie, the key to all of that, all relationships, marriage, friendship, whatever, is to really put Christ first, to put all of your hope and all of your trust as much as you can in him. Yes. So that, that way, everything else takes its proper priority. Our hopes and our lives are not dashed if we get rejected, if we get hurt, if we're afraid. Sure, it's disappointing. Sure, it might be hurtful, but we can still stand because we've got a strong foundation. And the stronger we stand in Christ, the better we stand in all of our relationships. 
Wow, that's so powerful, so powerful. And, you know, you all heard earlier talk about the importance of our identity. You know, if our identity is in anything outside of Christ, we're going to see everything with a blurred vision. But the, mm -hmm. but the truth of God's word comes alive in us. So, Monica, can I ask you to pray for the viewers today? Absolutely. Father, we come to you right now. Maggie and I and everybody that's watching, we come to you in Jesus' name. Father, you know the needs of every person that's watching. And I ask God in Jesus' name that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would meet every need, that you would open up our eyes, God, to your goodness, that you would open up our eyes, Father, to the truth of your word. And I ask you, Father, today that you would bring many miracles in the lives of your people. And Father, to the one that's mocking right now, to the one that doesn't believe, I ask that you would open their eyes to who you are. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Monica. What a wonderful time with you. I miss you. I love you. I thank I you for being you. here with us today. Thank you. Yes, for those of you watching, that please get this, uh, share this out to your friends or family because someone needs a word of encouragement and they need that grace filled love of Christ flowing through people. And many times, you know, I have learned so much uh, over the years from wise friends and counsels. And Monica, I'm so appreciative of you being in my life. I so appreciate knowing you. Blessed to call you a friend. And thanks for having me today, Maggie. Great time. Listen, y'all, we'll see you next time. We thank you and look forward to the next time here on Keys to Your Best Life.